In the SEC versus Ripple case, Ripple has filed their redacted reply to the SEC's opposition to Ripple's motion for summary judgment. This is the final submission where Ripple's going to ask the court to grant judgment in their favor. After two years, Ripple's mounted a very strong defense, and we'll take a deeper look at what they've put in this reply. But if we haven't met before, my name's Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. All right, courtesy of Attorney Filan, we have the document. I'll link it down below if you want to take a closer look into it. Let's just dive right in because it's lengthy and there are a few parts I want to touch on in more depth. It's 65 pages of the full document here. You can see signed off by all the attorneys at the bottom. It's 55 actual pages once you get into the motion itself. So there's a little bit of the preliminary material just like everything else. We've got the cover page. You've got their table of contents followed by table of authorities and then we really get into the meat of it which is the document itself. Lots of authorities cited here, many previous SEC cases referenced and so we'll look at it in more depth in a second. Let's just do the high level overview, what they're talking about here. They'll give their preliminary statement and argument and the main points that they're going to make is the SEC has failed to prove the existence of any investment contracts governing offers and sales of XRP made by the defendants. The defendants' XRP transactions were not in offers and sales of investment contracts under the Howey test. Uh, under that, they're going to attack multiple points of the Howey test. The SEC's brief confirms it cannot prove an investment of money. It uh, their brief also confirms it cannot prove a common enterprise and XRP holders do not reasonably expect profits from the efforts of defendants. Then they'll argue that individual defendants are entitled to summary judgment on offers and uh, to sell and sales on foreign exchanges. And then finally, they'll say Larson is entitled to summary judgment on offers and sales of XRP made before September 1st of 2015. And then at the end, they'll address that the SEC's amici do not support its case. So the amicus briefs that were actually filed on behalf of the SEC, and really I believe it was just the one that was allowed through. So we'll get into that in more detail. What I'm going to do here for the sake of time, I'm going to bypass the Garlinghouse and Larson uh, items. I think we're pretty versed in what's going on there with the two of them and honestly I don't think we have as much interest because those won't pertain to XRP holders whereas some of the statements made by the SEC in particular around what Ripple the company did will have more of a direct impact on holders and of course that's the bigger issue at hand and how the Howey test is applied there. So let's get right into the preliminary statement. So the SEC's opposition brief confirms that defendant's motion for summary judgment should be granted the SEC cannot show that any offer or sale of XRP, much less everyone, from 2013 to 2020, as it alleges, and bears the burden to demonstrate, was an offer or sale of an investment contract and therefore security under the federal securities laws. This case turns on statutory interpretation, specifically whether the SEC can misapply the statutory phrase investment contract to cover transactions that have none of the essential ingredients, in particular the bundle of ongoing rights and obligations that define an investment contract. It's a long-standing principle that legal terms of art used in statutes retain their established meaning. In the Howey test or the Howey case itself, the Supreme Court applied that principle to construe the term investment contract, which had a crystallized meaning before Congress passed the Securities Act, as defendants showed in their motion and as a comprehensive analysis provided by Paradigm in their amicus brief uh, confirms every pre-Howey case finding an investment contract, Howey itself and every Supreme Court and Second Circuit case following Howey involved one or more contracts imposing post-sale rights and obligations on the parties. The SEC nominally protests claiming to have found some cases where the essential ingredients of an, of an investment contract discussed in Howey were not present, but that claim does not hold up to scrutiny. The SEC simply mischaracterizes its cases. And they'll continue to carry on here more 
on the Howey test and the Howey elements in particular one by one. On the first element, the investment of money, the SEC concedes that billions of units of XRP distributed by defendants involve no investment of money at all. The SEC urges this court to find that defendants' failure to register these distributions still violated Section 5 because Section 5 prohibits indirectly selling securities to the public, but that sidesteps the threshold question whether these uh, transactions involved an investment contract which requires an investment of money in the first place. At the very least, the SEC's concession entitles defendants to partial summary judgment and requires denial of the SEC's motion. It also has a critical implication that the SEC does not acknowledge because all XRP is fungible. The SEC's position would lead to a completely unworkable result in which purchasers and sellers would have no way of knowing whether they were transacting in registered or unregistered XRP. Even for the transactions that involved an exchange of money, the SEC has failed to show that purchasers invested that money in a common enterprise, as Howie requires, rather than simply buying an asset. Defendant's motion explained that the SEC has never identified any viable common enterprise in this case. The SEC's opposition brief still does not even try to do so. Instead, it embarks on various tangents to suggest it can establish a common enterprise without ever actually pointing to one. That is wrong as a general principle, and it's wrong as to each of the SEC's theories regarding the common enterprise element. None can be squared with settled law, including Howey itself and the Second Circuit's binding precedent, Revac versus SEC Realty Corp. And on the final element of the Howey test, expectation of profits based solely on the efforts of others, the SEC cannot overcome two fun- fundamental flaws. First, no reasonable expectation can exist. Absent actual obligations undertaken by the promoter, the SEC has pointed to none. The SEC claims that defendants made promises, but that empty claim does not hold up. No evidence of any promise appears anywhere in the SEC's fact statements, and indeed the only mention of a promise that the SEC cites is a clear statement that Ripple was not making any. And you can see where they're citing this. The SEC also relies extensively on non-public statements that are irrelevant because no XRP buyer could have seen them. The hodgepodge of statements on which the SEC relies, some public and some private, does not suffice to create any legal obligations as Ripple itself told XRP holders. The undisputed truth, as the SEC is forced to concede in its response, is that Ripple owed no obligations to XRP holders. Second, as a matter of law, there can be no reasonable expectation of profits from others' efforts when market forces, rather than the alleged promoter, determine an asset's value. Here, the SEC's own expert witness concedes that from the mid-2018 period onward, Bitcoin and Ether returns can explain as much as almost 90% of XRP returns. The SEC offers no serious response and simply denies that the cases say what they say in establishing this legal rule. Together, these undisputed points demonstrate the SEC cannot satisfy the Howey test. In short, the SEC is asking the court to rewrite the statutes that define its authority for the SEC to prevail in its opposition. The court would have to endorse the SEC's theory that there can be an investment contract without any contract, without any investor rights, and without any issuer obligations. It would have to endorse the SEC theory that there can be a common enterprise even if the SEC cannot say what the enterprise is or prove any of the elements that define such enterprises. And it would have to endorse the SEC's theory that purchasers could reasonably have expected profits from Ripple's efforts, even though Ripple never promised to make any efforts, even though it expressly disavowed any obligation to do so, and even though profits were overwhelmingly due to Ripple's efforts, not due to Ripple's efforts, but to market forces. The court would have to conclude that all the amici that have expressly said they did not join a common enterprise or expect profits from Ripple's efforts are wrong about their own beliefs and actions. The SEC's position boils down to a view that any time someone buys an asset hoping to make money and the seller's interests are even partly aligned with the buyer's, it is a security subject to registration. That is not the law, even if the seller uses the sales proceeds to run its business. If Congress wants to expand the securities laws that way, it can do so, but this court should not. 
So their positions laid out here very clearly that they're going to disprove the SEC's arguments related to the Howey test and their position that seeks to expand the SEC's power and contort the Howey test into something it wasn't even meant to be. Now, keep in mind here, we are only on page five of this lengthy document, so we're going to pick up the pace significantly here as we go further into it. So as we get into the argument itself, they say the SEC has failed to prove the existence of any investment contracts governing defendants' offers and sales of XRP. This is straightforward, and the SEC certainly should know better than this. The SEC has declined to call the various essential ingredients of an investment contract essential. And they try and argue different things about investment contracts that simply don't exist. You can't interpret a statue without considering its words, writes the Ripple team. You cannot take a single sentence from Howie and apply it out of context. Howie suggests that would be inappropriate. And so as you go forward through this argument here, they'll go in more depth. But to put it in very succinct terms, the SEC attempts to bring this whole enterprise of offering and selling uh, XRP done by Ripple into this investment contract definition. But where are the actual contractual rights and obligations? They don't exist. And the SEC never successfully points to those. And when you look at the amicus briefs, you can also see that that is not the case. Let's move to the argument on the Howey test in particular, because uh, one of the major parts of this document, and every document truly, is that XRP transactions were not offers in sales under the Howey test that would constitute investment contracts. Remembering, again, the definition being this investment of money in a common enterprise where you're being led to expect profits solely from the efforts of a promoter or third party. Well, the SEC's brief confirms that it can't prove an investment of money. We've seen at various points in the history of Ripple where XRP was distributed without there being a transfer of money. And also, again, the fungibility question is another major item here. There would be no way, even if these assets were registered with the SEC, of saying this single XRP was registered or this one wasn't, or to define them in any such way, especially if you think now into current days, how could you ever go about doing that with it totally, in well, with more than half of the XRP circulating outside of Ripple. So as we move through the arguments next, they say the SEC's brief confirms it cannot prove a common enterprise. The SEC asks the court to hold the evidence not only supports a common en enterprise finding, but affirmatively requires it all while refusing to say what the supposed common enterprise is, nor does it acknowledge the contradictory positions it took on this issue previously. The reason for that continued omission is obvious. The SEC has no factual support for any legally cognizable common enterprise claim. In actual, Its actual theory is a broad vertical commonality approach that the Second Circuit's already rejected. To distract from that reality, the SEC switches between different common enterprise theories from paragraph to paragraph in its brief. The court should not endorse the SEC's efforts to trade an ambiguity. And so if you recall, we talked about this when we read through their document to begin with. The whole common enterprise theory running afoul of previous case law and the SEC not providing the forms of pooling under the REVAC uh, case. The SEC released a spray of irrelevant alternative legal theories, mostly focusing on what the SEC argues it doesn't have to prove. While the controlling precedent forecloses the SEC's claims, they're going to cite many instances here through the various case law and how the SEC's claims are impossible to square with previous case precedent, looking back to the horizontal and vertical commonalities that have been uh, defined and explained in both documents uh, for the Ripple side and for the SEC side, the SEC can't prove this horizontal commonality, which requires pooling investors' assets and a pooling of profits. Neither of those are present here when it comes to the sales of uh, XRP. The SEC claims it can prove it, but does not attempt to establish 
whether either of those required facts uh, are present and they don't have the evidence to do so. This is independently a fatal flaw to their claim, says Ripple. Now, as you move forward through their arguments, they're going to talk about vertical commonality now separately, saying it's insufficient and the SEC even still cannot prove vertical commonality. They've made arguments with non-binding district court decisions in their citations, most of which did not actually rely on strict vertical commonality. But even if it could suffice, the SEC is unable to prove it. Vertical commonality requires a one-to-one -one relationship between the investor and the promoter in which there's interdependence of both profits and losses. And that simply doesn't exist when looking at the sales of XRP. And when you look here, you're going to see the redactions in this document as those are the items still up for the decision of the court. So some things are, uh, are very interesting here. You can see SEC emails as being a partially redacted one here. It's also good to note some of the things that have happened here uh, in the footnotes. And I know we often bypass them, but you can see the library case has been cited here and some of the erroneous citations made by the SEC as well as some of the other outcomes. So do make sure if you go through this in further detail, you do actually pay attention to the footnotes. For the sake of time here, I'm bypassing some of that. But the divergence between reality and the SEC's claims is really what is fatal to the SEC's arguments. The SEC's remaining common enterprise attack, or arguments attack straw men, meaning that they don't really come at uh, Ripple in the way that things actually happen in reality. And investment contracts have to have economic properties of a debt or equity security, and you just don't see that with a fungible asset uh, like uh, XRP. The common enterprise uh, element requires control by the promoter, but once uh, the XRP is in circulation. Ripple does not have control over that. It's not like a share of stock uh, that's issued and still has ties and ownership rights. That just simply doesn't exist. And the SEC's argument has no principled limits, as basically they are arguing that any kind of asset they could define as a security if they cast a wide enough net. So now, as you continue here, uh, XRP holders do not reasonably expect profits from defendants' efforts. There can be no reasonable expectation of profits from defendants' efforts in the absence of any obligation to XRP holders. There's obviously no connection between many XRP holders and Ripple, if many if not most, as those are totally separate uh, transactions where you've got secondary transactions uh, in secondary markets between uh, peers, so peer-to-peer -peer transactions. You've got other projects where XRP is used in a transactional nature. You've got all the amicus briefs citing various use cases for XRP outside of Ripple uh, being even part of the conversation. And so they'll argue more on those points. And as you continue on through here, uh, they'll say XRP holders cannot reasonably expect profits from Ripple when profits are attributable to market forces, citing again what the SEC's own witness has said that most of the movement of XRP price has come with the broader crypto market versus Ripple's efforts. Now we've made it through to the uh, section about the individual defendants, which I am going to bypass, but you can see they've dedicated about 10 pages here in the middle to that. And then as you go through, uh, you'll see the further arguments on behalf of um, Chris Larson and his entitlement to summary judgment on offers and sales before September 1st of 2015. And then finally, the two amici that the SEC had on their behalf the Ripple team argues that their proposals do not actually support the SEC's case. In fact, both support granting defendant's motion for summary judgment and denying the SEC's motion. So they're flipping the script. They say NSEI raises a policy argument to suggest that crypto should be regulated by the SEC to promote investor protection. It does not identify any protections or benefits that registration would confer on purchasers of digital assets because there are none. As other amici explain, registration would only impose significant burdens on digital asset holders and increase the costs of transactions. Moreover, in making this argument, NSEI makes clear that the SEC cannot prevail 
on existing law. Now, secondly, if Credify argues that Ripple's fair notice defense should fail, but its argument only proves that the law in this area is hopelessly ambiguous. For example, it discusses at length the concept of decentralization, arguing on the basis of the Hinman speech that if an asset's ownership is decentralized, it should not be considered a security, and even putting forth its own four-factor test to delineate the path to decentralization and non-security status. That only underscores why defendants and other market participants lacked fair notice. The SEC never offered clear guidance. In any event, even if their so-called test, whether one or few centralized entities control 50 or more percent of the total issuance of the asset, if that were the governing law, that would mean XRB has attained its own non-security status as Ripple owns less than 50 percent of XRP. Now, the recent judgment or in or the recent decision in the library case does not help the SEC. They write with respect to fair notice. There, the court rejected the defendant's fair notice defense because it was nothing more than a bald claim without any supporting evidence behind it. Here, defendants have demonstrated an exacting detail supported by extensive evidence that market participants did not believe XRP was a security, that they lacked guidance as to what the law prohibited in this area and told the SEC as much and that the SEC knowingly injected further confusion into the marketplace through its contradictory guidance, all of which confirmed in any event that XRP should not be considered a security. And in conclusion, they write, the court should grant defendants motion and deny the SEC's motion signed by Kellogg and all the other attorneys on behalf of Ripple, Garlinghouse, and Larson. So I hope that was helpful. I know this was a lengthy one, and we went through it pretty quick. A lot of it is rehashing things we've seen before. I tried to pick out the things I thought were the most unique that we hadn't seen, like the uh, rebuttal of the SEC's amicus briefs uh, and so on. So I hope that was useful and uh, more meaningful than rehashing some of the old points. But I'll link it down below if you do want to check it out in more detail. Uh, do me a favor, if you don't mind, hit a like. It helps the channel a ton, and it helps me keep you informed. Uh, videos lately haven't been going out. The algorithm seems to be uh, not liking me as much these days, so your likes certainly do help. Hit that subscribe button uh, so I can keep you up to date on all the latest news. We still have yet to see the SEC's document, and I will certainly discuss that in more detail once it's available. Thank you so much for spending some time here with me. I do truly appreciate it. Have a fantastic rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one.